All right, so we shall read First Peter chapter one verses one to four. Right, First Peter chapter one verses one to four. Although we will be mainly covering chap- uh, verse two tonight. First Peter one, one to four. Reading, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. May God bless the reading of his blessed word. Let's turn to him in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us once again into thy house. We thank you especially for safe journeys and helping us through a very hot week. Lord, we do ask that um, you remove all tartness and distraction from among us in every group. Lord, may your children's heart be um, drawn to you. May your Holy Spirit revive our spirit and cause us to not only understand your word, but to live by it. So Father, we pray again for cleansing, for washing in the blood of our Saviour. We have sinned against you in many ways, we are sure. May you show to us that we may confess and repent and always bear the fruit of repentance. So Lord, we pray for your blessing tonight, that your children will be strengthened in the faith by your word, through your Holy Spirit. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now please remember the background. First Peter is written to the Christians that were, in verse 1, scattered, scattered, and they were like strangers. So remember this word, eh? the context is very important. They were like strangers in, in the land. Um, Elim, why did they become strangers? They were born in this country, many of them. Well, some they got scattered, but some they were born there. Why were they strangers? Because what? Because our home is in heaven. Right? They became Christians and really the home is in heaven. But why call them strangers? Why not heaveners? Why were they kind of like strangers? Uh, Jennifer? Say again. To remind them that they are strangers. If you are a stranger, then this world is not your home and then don't conform. Don't be like them. In fact, they were not like them. All right? So they were kind of like strangers. Uh, Esther and, and Ruth are strangers in, in Australia. Strangers in a sense, you, you don't live in this country per se. You don't, you don't belong in this country. Kind of strangers, out of place. But in this case, it's much more than that, all right? Later on, we'll see Peter describing them as um, pilgrims, pilgrims, all right? Now, please remember this point about strangers, all right? Because it's important when we study and try to understand more about election, okay? So, strangers different from them in their, even in their own country, different because their lives have changed. Their lives have changed, all right? Strangers. Okay, so remember this word. And now, who can remember? Now, immediately after he said, now, look at verse 1. He said, I, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered in all these places. He refers to the strangers, the believers, as verse 2 says, elect. All right, elect. Um, what is an elect? Do you remember? Yeah. Phoebe, elect. The chosen of God. All right? Chosen, elect. All right? They were chosen. Um, the Christians, the believers, they were chosen of God. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, and then he made this statement. So please pay attention to this statement. Look at verse 2. This is where we're going to focus and continue focusing on it. Um, now I say to the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father we've studied that already 
Now, then he comes to this phrase, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He made this statement. Now, who remembers why, after an introduction, immediately at this introduction, say, or uh, I, Peter, to you strangers, the elect, he want to make this statement about the elect through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a bit difficult, all right? Uh, maybe I get, get the older one. Josiah. Josiah. So remember the context. He's writing to persecuted Christians. These people live obedient to God and their lives were persecuted and they were like strangers, okay? And Peter, so, so Josiah, if you are writing a letter to Cornelius and Caleb, Cornelius and Caleb are suffering persecution. They are very troubled, all right? And they are very, um, um, uh, life is very difficult. Now, what would you write? What would your opening um, letter, the let, opening in your letter, what would you want to try to do or write about, Josiah? Encourage them. Very good. Encourage them. Alright? So this, he said, you are an elect. It was to encourage. Although you are strangers in this land. Uh, Chloe, when Christ... Uh, no, your turn. Alright? When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Veronica, um, then you become like strangers to some of your friends. You don't dress like them. You don't go to play certain places with them. You don't say certain things and all that. Then you're like strangers, and then they treat you very badly. They say, oh, I'm so out of place in school. You're not out of place in school? Like stranger, all right? Like stranger. What will comfort you? You say, I, I don't belong, I don't belong here. Every day I go to go to school. But every day when I go to school, or some of you working Christians, every day I go to work, I'm like a stranger. I don't belong. What would comfort you? What would encourage you? Say again. Praying would comfort you. Well, very good. All right. But when someone writes something to you, what would comfort you? Uh, okay, move to the... Okay, this one you can try. Cornelius. What would comfort you? You don't belong. You go, oh, I'm like a stranger. You don't belong anywhere. So what would comfort you? Say again. God's word will comfort you. What in God's word? Like here, he's, the why he wants to talk about being an elect is to, like Josiah said, the first thing he wants to comfort them. They are scattered. They are living a difficult life. The elect is to comfort them. Is to let them know, yeah, you are strangers. You don't belong anywhere at this time. But please know, an elect, as an elect, you belong in heaven. You, be, you have a place of belonging. Now, we, we just sit here like nothing. Oh, oh. Yeah. But if you are in their position, then just this word, elect, you will probably cry just reading and hearing about it. I don't belong anywhere. People treat me so badly. But oh, suddenly this refreshing reminder, I'm an elect. Elect means will you lose your salvation? Will you lose your salvation, um, Chloe? If you are elect, will you lose your salvation? No, you will not. It's such a sure thing. Just to hear the word elect, elect will comfort them. So now they know I belong somewhere. Please, uh, I'm, I'm not saying all this for no reason. It's going to build up to something that you have to understand. So all this is building up. You say, you belong. You belong. You belong to God. You're an elect of God. You belong to Him. So what if you don't belong, you don't have no sense I don't have a sense of belonging in school among your friends. In Christian school, do you fit in? Wait, those in Christian school, Elim. Just because you're in Christian school, do you, do you fit in like, like everybody feels that you are the same kind of Christian as them? You, do feel, you don't know. You don't know. You don't think about these things. Sometimes you may not even. You're a Christian at work. You may even have Christian colleagues at work. But when you go, you know you are different from them. When you want to obey God, you want to live according to God's word, you become very different to them. But just to remember that it's okay. It's okay. I belong to God. I belong to God. Right? So this. Now, then he says this. 
Okay, now we got to break this up, huh? you remember? Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this is one statement. Okay, this is one statement. So, I think um, some of you were not here last week when we covered this. Now, after Peter encouraged them, you are an elect. Now, but he wants to remem- remind them, you are an elect. You are an elect. And as an elect, he wants them to know very quickly, as an elect, you must know what God intends in your life as an elect. I say again, huh? now, to tell them they're elect, or oh, comfort them, good. But the details of being an elect must be known to them. So now he says, now, dear elect, do you know that through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, now as an elect, as an elect, the intention of God, now listen carefully, are you an elect? Well, if you believe you are saved, you are an elect, then you must know this. God said as an elect, that through the sanctification of the Spirit, God wants to achieve, wants you to know two things must be true in your life. Through the sanctification of the Spirit, onto, onto what? What is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Sanctification. You are elect, you must know the work of the Holy Spirit in my life is sanctification. As an elect, after elect, after, after being saved. And God says now, through that, the Holy Spirit it will work two things in your life. Alright? Onto what? Your life is onto obedience, right? Is one. What's the second? Onto what? Onto sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now please know this. When you get saved, you must understand through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, God says there's two things must happen in your life. One, two. Two things. Very broadly. So we studied what is obedience, in detail already, obedience is hearing under, coming under God's commandments, listening to, obeying, and living by it. All right? It is like a military soldier will live very closely uh, to the commandments, to the commands of the general. It's that kind of idea. So the work of the Holy Spirit unto obedience. So the Christian must know obedience in your life. Is it expected? Yes, that is the intention of election. Intention of election, all right? Now, before we come here, huh? then we studied sanctification, right? Make sure you remember. What is sanctification? If you know the work of the Holy Spirit is a work of sanctification, what is the root meaning of sanctification? This word appears in Greek. But in English, it can be translated to different words, all right? But what's the root meaning of sanctification? Now move to the back. Uh, Just say that. Uh, Joshua, what's the root meaning? Set apart. Please know. Please remember this. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to do revision. uh. Number one, some people are not here. Number two, it's all linked to this thing that we have to study tonight, all right? Because there's two things you must know that it's part of your life, obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you don't know this, it's like, okay, I'm an elect, but what does all this mean? But before you even get there, God say, uh, all right, sanctification, well, not very red, uh, sanctification of the Holy Spirit to these two things. Okay? Sanctification. Sanctification don't just think of it as be pure, uh, don't sin, get rid of sin. Understand the root meaning first. It means set apart. Set apart. Alright? Set apart. Now, why is it more important to remember it as set apart? Uh, Elaine. <laughs> set apart for God's use. It's not just set apart, set apart. We can set ourselves apart but we must remember it's set apart for God. 
Can you live a holy life, a pure life, but not for God? Ichung. Absolutely possible. You just want to be a good Christian. You just want to please your parents. You just want to please church. You just want to live a very moral life. But you were never someone who lived onto God. I set myself apart for God. Why is the concept of setting myself apart for God before we even talk about don't sin, get rid of sin and all that, why is that more important than just simply say sanctify means don't sin? Why is it more important to understand the root meaning? Number one is because it's for God. Please remember, I do this for God. Number two, My question is, alright, my question is, when we just think of sanctification as don't sin, get rid of sin, instead of the bigger picture of sanctification is set apart for God, why is it more important that we understand it's set apart for God? It's a far more powerful effect. Yeah. Otherwise, we just do, 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 and it can look to pride. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a holy person. That is all. all right? Now that's one. But there's one key one. All right, ask married people. I think married people may remember. Julia, do you remember? Why this concept of set apart is, is very important than just don't sin? Very good. Now, when we remember set apart for God, that is what it means to be holy. By the way, uh, the word holy, the word pure, the word holy, pure and all in the Bible, in fact the word saints, the word saints, all come from the same root word, set apart. Alright? So, Michelle, you are a saint. If you are elect, you believe in God, God says you are a saint. And elect, the saint, the saint. And God says, be holy, Michelle. All this word is the same meaning. Be set apart. Jemima, be set apart. Now, why is it more important to understand it in this form? Is when you get rid of sin. When you choose not to sin. You, in your heart, know very clearly I'm, I'm doing this for God. I am set apart to God. So it's very important that I keep God in mind. I'm obeying God, not church, not my mother, not my father. I am being holy because I'm set apart and I'm doing all this because of God. That's all. Not because people will praise me. Wow, what a holy girl. What a holy boy. Not because of that. Neither is it because, well, I have to. But being holy, be pure, the same. I do it because of God. That is important. The purpose is very clear in your heart now. Right? Like for a husband, I use that example. For a husband, or for a wife, when you, why do you not commit adultery? Why, when you're tempted, do you choose not to commit adultery? Why? Why? The most powerful and sustaining reason is I am now set apart to my spouse. How can I do this? How can I do this? Alright? If it is only for yourself, okay, if you don't understand this concept, don't sin means I am set apart for God. Because of God, I don't sin. How can I do this? But if you don't have this concept set apart for God, if it is set apart for yourself, you just do it for yourself. What will happen, Jemima? Then you start to get tired of doing that. Uh, Alright, after some time you get tired. You say, well, I don't want to be such a person. Have you come across Christians who are like that? So-called Christians. For when they're young, they're very obedient. I hope none of you be that, huh? When you're young, very obedient, very obedient, very obedient. I must be holy, I must be holy, I must be, I must be a saint, I, I must be pure. And then you grow up, you grow up, you grow up, 
But because you never thought of being holy, being sanctified as being set apart for God, it is for God, after some time you just say, forget it, actually I don't want to be such a person. I'm not interested in being such a person. Caleb, will you be like that when you grow up? Don't know. You say no. By God's grace, I do not want to. You leave, will you? Means as you grow up, you say, hey, forget it. I don't want to be such a person. But when it is, I remember I'm set apart for God, then you always say, I can't say I don't want to be such a person. I'm doing this for God. Remember? All right, so that's very important. Another one. Now, I ask you, Michelle, if you're doing it to please your parents, or church, or or friends, all right? What will happen when you're alone? No one sees, no one know. You might stop doing it, right? You might stop doing it. Say, well, no one's watching it. I'm being holy just because of parents, just because of church, just because of friends. I'm being pure just because of that. Now no one is seeing. So I can just do it. No one knows, right? But once you understand be holy, be pure as a saint, it means I'm set apart for God. Then at any time, you know God is always there. You do or don't do something simply because of God. You will continue to be such a person the rest of your life. Right? Okay, so understanding this concept is very, very important. Set apart. Alright, remember this word. Eh? So please understand this concept. Now, then we come to this. We understood why it's obedience. Now, God says that Christian, alright, listen carefully. Look at your Bible verse. God says, now through, now as an elect, God says, my, my intention and my purpose for you is, I will send the Holy Spirit that through the sanctification work of the Holy Spirit, it is for two things in your life. One, obedience. Two, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So now I ask you this question, which I ask you to go back and think, right? So see, anyone thought about it? Now, there are two things that must happen. You understand what is obedience already. Just to make sure. Um, Brenda, what is obedience? God elected you, God saved you, and the Holy Spirit work in your life is to achieve these things. Obedience. What is obedience? Very good. The word obedience is to hear for the purpose of obeying. Alright? This is the meaning. I go under the word of God, I listen under the word of God, but it has this aspect in, for the purpose of obeying Him. So God says, I want this in your life. So the Christian, if after salvation, you don't come and study God's Word, you don't do your devotion, you don't, you're not interested in the Word of God, the very thing that God says, I expect this to be the rest of your life. Please look here. Now these two things, these two things, God says, I expect this to be for the rest of your life. The sanctification onto sanctif the sanctification of the Holy Spirit onto obedience and sprinkling of the blood, I want it to be for the rest of your life as an elect. Then you say, all right, Lord, I understand this. That's why I will always do my quiet time because I'm supposed to obey. Obey means hear and do. I will always study your word. For the rest of my life, the picture in my mind is I will never, ever not come and listen to God's word, study his word and obey it. It will be something that will always be part of my life. All right? So, Chloe, when you grow up, will you keep going to church to listen to God's word for the rest of your life? Because this is what God wants? You must. Don't ever think, well, you know, uh, Elim, why are you here tonight? Say again? To learn God's word. To learn God's word. Not because your mommy and your daddy is here and then they expect you to be here. No. And when you grow up, your daddy and mommy says, uh, daddy and mommy is, is traveling, right? Is traveling to visit a relative in Hong Kong. Then you're alone. Will you come to church on your own? I, I, I mean, if you have, 
Okay, uh, someone will drive you to church. Will you come? Hello, Ilim. I know your daddy and mommy is not around. Ilim, let's go to church. You will come because God says, for the rest of my life, this is what God's want. Here and do. Here and do. I will always come to church. Now, why do I say this? Are there people who can't wait? When I go back to Singapore, oh, I'm not going to go to church. Or when I go to Perth, I'm not going to go to church anymore. All the while, daddy and mommy forced me to church. I'm not going to go. I can't wait to run away from church. Does it cross your mind, Phoebe? No, right? Well, I hope not. Just imagine until the day you have white hair, you hold tongkat, you still will continue to know that obedience is God's Holy Spirit work for the rest of my life. That is my life. Not changing. Don't even have a thought that when I start working, some of you are going to start working, right? I keep saying, no matter what happens in your life, you must know this. God, as an elect, God chose you. How does God want your life to look like the rest of your life through the work of the Holy Spirit? How does God want it to look like? I'm always having these two things in my life. Understand? These two things will always be part of my life. Okay? Now, so now we know what this is. Say yes. But now the question is, what is this? Because if you don't know, then this is not happening in your life. Possibly, right? Uh, who is that? Susan. Is this happening in your life, Susan? Is this happening in your life? To the best of my knowledge, I try to keep it in, for the, in my life, right? That's why I come in. But to the best of my knowledge, and by the grace of God, I want this to be so for the rest of my life. To the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, right? Now I ask you, Susan, is this happening in your life since the day you got saved? You can't answer. Why can't you answer? Because I don't know when it is. So it may be, it may not be. Right? So we must know what this means. Alright? We must know what this means. Because God expects this to be the picture of our life for the rest of our life, you know? Okay. Now, so what does it mean? Anyone manage to find out what it means? What does the sprinkling, question number one, what does the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ point to? Uh, okay, so Susan asked already. Uh, Alright, Kenny, any idea? About repentance. About repentance. Mm. About oh, what? what? Repentance and forgiveness of sin. Because we're always saying, um, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? <laughs> right? Uh, now, cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb definitely cleanses us from all our sins. Okay, that's for sure. But this act of the sprinkling of the blood is very specific. And the, and the washing and cleansing by the blood of the Lamb is only part of it. Alright? What do you think it is? Uh, Julia asked already. Alright, uh, Ruth, any ideas? No idea. Uh, all right, sister, help Esther. Rescue. No idea. No idea. Also. All right. So I guess nobody's an idea. I'll just ask you. Do you remember in the Old Testament? Now this is definitely Old Testament. Okay, that's why you don't see pastors sprinkling blood on your every Sunday. All right, it won't be very pleasant. All right. Now, you know it's not new it's not physical thing that happens in the New Testament. But is it something that God expects in the New Testament? Wait. Is it something God expects in the New Testament? Elim. It must be uh, Peter wrote it, right? Peter wrote it to the people. Peter wrote it to the people that it says the sanctific through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit unto obedience and this thing. So it must be expected in the New Testament also, correct? Now I ask you, in the Old Testament, can you think of the time when this thing was done? Uh, Jennifer, can you remember? The people gather and then the, they take this, this brush or hyssop and then they dip it into the 
the, the blood of the animal that has been sacrificed and then they sprinkle alright so a lot of people right all right, then, so they sprinkled, so sprinkling was throw very far, right? Then some of the blood will hit the head or the face or the body. And then they, they, they got they got sprinkled. When did it happen in the Old Testament? Say again? Moses. Moses, very good. Did the adults know? I think you know also Moses. Moses. Alright, let's turn to so Peter alluded to Exodus 24 Moses right? Moses took the blood and he sprinkled on the people Moses chapter 24 So Peter talked about this Why? Why? This is supposed to be part of your life after salvation And this is what God brings about through salvation Now let's read verses um, 1 to Eight, right? 24, 1 to 8. So you think very carefully yeah, what's happening. Chapter 24, verse 1 to 8, reading. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the word, Lord. And all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words of the Lord, which the Lord has said, will, will, will we do. Verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basons, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar, and he took the book of the covenant and read it to the audience of the people, and they all said, All that the Lord has said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Alright, so this is the event. Peter talked about this. He said the Holy Spirit, unto, uh, on, through the work of the Holy Spirit, unto obedience and this thing, sprinkling of the blood, the sanctification, work. What does it mean? Any ideas? Now we go to Cornelius, quickly. What's I, what is happening here when Moses did that? What was happening? What was the thing that was being done or set? Any idea? Okay, no idea. Hmm? Wow! Is it something to do with the covenant? Why do you say that? It's so bloody and, and all that. Covenant, why? Very good. Verse 8, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant. This thing has to do with the covenant. Has to do with the covenant. Alright? So, what is it about? What about the covenant? What about the covenant? What is happening here? What just happened here? Josiah, I kill him. In this, in this something to do with covenant, what just happened in this covenant process? They what, sorry? They make? They made offerings. They did that. Josiah, quickly. What do you think just happened between God and the people? They made a covenant. Alright, they made a covenant. And when this covenant was made, what happened and what was the end result? What did they do? Joshua, what did they do? We read the, the whole from verse 8, 1 to 8. Very good. Now, look at what is happening here. The words of the Lord was pronounced and the people committed to obeying it. Okay? How do we know? Now, so Moses, Moses in verse 3, I say, he told the people, now, I will tell you all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. Two things. I'll tell you all the words and all the judgments of God. 
Now notice in verse 3 what happened. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words of the Lord, which all the words which the Lord hath said, we will we do. Now what is happening? You imagine you're there that day. Eh? A lot of people gathered. Moses said, Okay, let me declare to you all the judgments and all the words of the Lord. Then the people will all shout in one voice. Together in one voice, they, they said, All the words which the Lord has said, will we do. Now something is happening, understand that. This is not just like um, a casual gathering, and then we hold a church outing, then I happen to say something, and then... No, it is an organized, arranged meeting of declaring the words, and will you obey or not? Will you obey or not? And then they say, okay, if you want, we will all with one voice say, as one people, we all agree. Now, please note the word one voice. One voice, all right? Now, and then, all right, Moses said, okay, I, I declare, and then you all said, you all will obey, right? What did Moses do in verse 4? All right, so Moses went and wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning. Okay, so Moses was like a judge, all right? I declare, you all say, yes, sir. Huh? So I go back and I write down all these things and early in the morning, this is settled. When early in the morning he woke up, then he took the blood. He said, yesterday we talked about this. I declare, you say yes, you will obey. Then the next morning, he took the blood and said, alright, gather again. Now I scattered, I sprinkled the blood. Because yesterday you said yes, so I sprinkled the blood. Okay, so that is what is happening. Now, and the Bible tells us in verse 8 that this is the blood of the covenant. So a covenant, the people entered into covenant with the Lord. Understand this. That is what happened. Now, and in this covenant, um, alright, so question number one. Eh? Uh, you, you answered the first part, you answered the second part. Where is it found in the Bible? Exodus 24, um, 6 to 8. Now, don't answer, compare first. We just, what are the key concepts? The key concept is, number one, it is about being in covenant with God. Remember that. As an elect, you are in covenant with God. That is something you must remember for the rest of your life. Okay? Hey, um, saints, saints, what are you in the rest of your life with God? In a covenant. Okay? Now, that's one of the concepts. Now, the second concept. Hey, by the way, I preached on this before. Make sure you understand. What is a covenant? Who remembers? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, Elaine, do you remember? Covenant. I preached on a Sunday. The beginning, first lesson on Joshua. Joshua was about covenant. Contract. Alright, so it's a, it's a contract means it's between a, a agreement all right agreement between parties that's the first thing you must know about covenant it's an agreement between parties very important because we are going to understand this concept you must know it is between parties number one what's the second thing who remember uh, issue right, there's, the there's purpose very good there's purpose okay the thing that people always forget when you say, as a Christian, I'm in covenant with God, you must know there's an agreement and there is a purpose set. In all contracts, there's a purpose. You don't sign a contract when there's no purpose in the contract. It's no meaning, right? You join a company, they tell you, we're signing a contract and the purpose of, this, of you joining the company, these are all the things you must do. So that purpose, purpose, whose purpose? Shenwei, your purpose. Whose purpose? God's purpose, alright? In this covenant, God said, I declare my purpose to you, want or not. That's why God says, Moses said, I will declare all the words, I will declare all the words and the judgment. These are God's words and His purposes. This, you agree to be, to you agree to be subject to it? The people say yes. The people say yes, alright? And then, with that, there's terms and conditions, right? Blessings for obedience, Cursings for disobedience. Same when you go when you work. Uh, you, wait, next, Chloe, have you signed a contract before? Okay, I'm sure not. Jemima, have you signed a contract before? No. Uh, Michelle, no. You signed a contract before. In the contract, are there terms and conditions that say if you fail to perform the 
conditions in this contract, there will be penalties. Uh, it depends why you fail. Uh, depends why you fail. Uh. Okay. Yeah. You right. So by and large, if you purposely don't fulfill, there are penalties, right? Right? So same. So a covenant. Alright, so they entered into a covenant. You are in a covenant with God. The rest of your life, when you get saved, it's not I agree to get saved, alright? It's not I, I, God, okay, I agree to get saved. Elect means elect. God conquered you, God redeemed you, God made you His people. Okay? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you didn't have to choose to be saved? If you have to choose to be saved, would you choose? You will not choose to be saved. So God conquered us with His love, He, he saved us, and God says now, as an elect, as an elect, you agree to these commandments of mine. You are expected to agree, and if you don't, that there are, there are blessings. If you do, if you don't, there are chastisements. All right. So this is how, what happened. Now, so this is one concept. Now the other concept is now. Then you have to be very um, sharp to observe this. What do you think is another concept? So a covenant occurred, and they're in covenant. What is the other concept about this thing that happened in verse twenty-four, uh, chapter twenty-four? Actually, it may not be clear here. But do you know that Peter, he talked about this, right? Now, um, you turn back to Peter, right? So now you understand this. Now you turn back to P Peter. You turn back to Peter. Peter... In the beginning, talked about this, but Peter also talked about this later. All right. Now, um, <coughs> what is one very important concept about being God's covenant, being in covenant with God? Anyone remember or occur to you? Wait and move on, um, Susan. A very important concept. Actually, you brought your parents, your mom, and your sister to attend that session about covenant. There's a very important concept about covenant. Starts with P, alright, give you easier. P. Don't remember. Um, Kenny? No. What's a P? He will not forsake you. Julia, any remembrance? Very important. Don't remember. Alright, last. Ruth, Esther. Very important concept about being covenant with God. Starts with P. No. Anyone try? Last one, Joshua. Huh? Possession. Possession. Alright, yes, has to do with possession. Cannot see anymore. Possession. Well, yes, has to do with possession. Now, then Peter talk about this. Let's turn to First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two. So, hey, wow, very sad, huh? All of us. God says, on to sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Most of us don't know what is this. Then are we fulfilling it? First Peter chapter two. Now he talked about this and he reminded them. Now, if you scan through, those of you who did your outline, I give you a hint. In the first 10 verses, where do you think Peter talked about this in chapter 2? He repeated this concept about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, move on. Back to here, Elim. Chapter 2, 1 to 10. Where do you think Peter talked about this concept of covenant being his possession? Verses 1 to 10. And it starts with P. Yeah. In fact, in chapter 24, you read it over and over again. What is the from verses 1 to 10? Jennifer, quickly. Then I'll quickly. Quickly, Jennifer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
Okay, I'm sure Brenda knows the answer. Hurry up, Brenda. Yes. <laughs> Precious. Okay. Now, please look. Please look. Look at verse 10. Let's read verse 10 together. Which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had obtained mercy, which have not obtained mercy, but now have to obtain mercy. Now, look up here. Look up here. If... Before your salvation, before your salvation, you did not obtain mercy yet, correct? You're just an elect, but you have not obtained mercy. Now, when as an elect, God saved you, God saved you, then God says, in the past you were not, but now you are. You are in the past you were not what, and now you are what? Michelle, in the past you were not what, and now you are what? In the past, you were not. In, look at verse 10. In the past, you were not a people. Before you were saved, you were not a people of God. But now you are a people of God after you obtain mercy. Correct? Alright? So, you notice that when they answered, you say, they answered with one voice. And the people answered with one voice. Moses called the people together. And Moses, the next morning, called the people together. And Moses sprinkled the blood on the people. Alright? And here, we understand from the New Testament, if actually in the Old Testament, they understood this. Being in covenant with God. I've entered in covenant with God as, and now I've become His people. Understand that? Please, I don't know how, what I can do to help you remember that. I, want to, I feel like climbing out on this, on this rostrum and scream so that you never forget this concept in your life as a Christian. You are a people of God. Remember that. So when he told the people, you are an elect, it comforted them. Right? You are an elect. Your place is sure in heaven. Correct? But now he says another thing. He talked about this. The people who were the Jews, they understood what this is. They were reminded of the covenant. They reminded there are people. As strangers scattered. Remember in the beginning, I kept saying, I'm, I'm emphasizing on strangers for a reason. They felt like strangers. They felt like outsiders. They felt they don't belong in this world, right? After assuring them about their place in heaven, he said, but I know on earth it's not easy. Let me remind you, when you are saved, for the rest of your life, remember that. One is obedience, the other, you are a people of God. This sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, they would immediately remember their history, the covenant, like Jennifer, remember the Moses sprinkling blood. They remember all those things and they remember it is about a people. That's why in chapter 2, in chapter 2, verses verse 10, he reminded them again, hey, strangers and pilgrims. In fact, you look, um, you look at um, where is that? Okay, now you look at verse ten, right? Chapter two, verse ten. He said, Dear, "Which in time past you were not a people, now a people." Then verse eleven, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now he is relating these people and strangers and pilgrims to encourage them and to remind them. Please know, after salvation, this concept of people must be very strong in your life. Okay? So, what's the sprinkling of the blood about? A covenantal people of God. Covenantal people of God. That is very, very important concept. Okay, now we're going to ask, so what does it mean? What does it mean? Look up here. Alright, two things, right? One, this one, easier to understand and remember, correct? Obey. But now the question is this, for the rest of my life, obey. Glad you do so, Lord. For the rest of my life, covenantal people. Uh, Lord, but I don't really know what that entails and what I'm supposed to do. What I'm supposed to, to be. What is it that is supposed to happen, happen in my life, knowing that as an elect, the Holy Spirit, work in my life and this covenantal people concept what is it supposed to be like now but let's quickly answer question one first let's now let's compare can you please turn to exodus chapter 24 again i want you to compare 
I want you to compare. Okay? Now, can you see the parallel? Can or not? <laughs> okay. Whose turn is it? Can you see the parallel? Okay, back to here. Shenry, can you see the parallel between chapter 24? Right, I narrow down for you. Chapter 22 versus... Hey, chapter 24, verse, verse, uh, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. And 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 2. Second part. Do you see the parallel? There's people that say, okay. But do you see more parallel? <laughs> Chloe, do you see parallel? There's a repeat, there's an exact repeated thing there. About, about the people of God. Two things must happen in the people of God's life. Ah, okay, so now you hear here. Yes, right? So notice it's exactly the same. Please look at Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. What is verse 27? That is, the Lord, what, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be what? Be obedient, right? Be obedient. And then after that, there was a sprinkling of the blood, correct? Now look at First Peter chapter two, eh, chapter one. First Peter chapter one, verse two. The same thing, the same thing, the same reminder. There was what the sanctification of the Holy Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of blood, exactly the same. Now, the same for the Old Testament people, the same for the New Testament people. The elect people of God in covenant lives life of obedience and as a covenantal people. Okay, I'm going to scream this. Huh? For the rest of your life, and we're going to answer the rest of the question. For the rest of your life, two things as an elect. The work of the Holy Spirit, He keeps working this in my life. And I must live this life for the rest of my life. One, obedience. Like the people say, we will obey. Number two, a covenantal people of God. Alright? For the rest of my life, these two things must characterize my life. Cannot. All right, you're tired of hearing that. All right. The question is, will we live it? Now, what does it mean? Question number two. Now, give examples in Peter's First Peter's uh, Peter's epistle. So you write the example is First Peter two ten two ten. We already said example where Peter um, gives instruction about the purpose of our election. First Peter two ten. Right. You say in the past you were not people. Now you are people. Right. Now, please read verse 9 together with me, or shall we say memorize by heart, uh, say by memory. Alright, let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, please note a few words. You are a holy nation. Okay, I always pick on Jemima whenever it comes to this. Jemima, what's the meaning of holy? Huh? Pure. Set apart. You are a set apart people. You are a set apart nation. Hey, by the way, this is all on New Testament. We just read New Testament, right? This New Testament. Are we a nation? Israel was a nation. We are not a nation. But Peter just said, please remember you are a holy nation. Should we form nation of Bible Presbyterian Church? No? All nations. Now it still say we to collectively are still Christians. God look at us as a people, like a nation, a people to him, a set apart nation. And he says a peculiar people. And then he say one you used to be not a people of God. Now you're people of God. Alright, so Peter talked about this. He did talk about this. Now in fact he said, How should people live? Huh? You can write the next part he mentioned about this again, chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. Chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. Can you see chapter 4, verse 8 to 9? Now he says, now please, let's read, verse, let's read verse 8 and 9. And above all, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. He reminded us we are a people. Live like that with each other. Alright, he's not writing this with no meaning. 
you are a people. How can you not be kind, be loving, have hospitality to one another, have charity to one another? Come on, you are a people. Hey, by the way, when, when you went to Japan as a Singaporean, all right? Yeah. And Singapore, when you were there, when you saw Singaporeans, hey, you're not Singaporean. You are what, Rian? Indonesian. When you, when you see Indonesian, you hear them speak, and then do you feel some kindred spirit with them? And then if you see, oh, maybe they get in trouble, they, they, they need some help, it's a natural desire to help an Indonesian. That's some of it, right? Naturally, right? So he's saying, hey, come on, you are, look up here, you are a people. You are people. How can you be fighting? unkind to one another. Naturally, a people would help each other, right? Okay, so in, that's why I kept saying he in there will talk about many things. When it comes to that, I'm just telling you that Peter is building the rest of his epistle on these things. Okay, he's talking about obedience, which we'll see. He'll talk about this. Now, where else will you see that? Look at chapter 5. Look at chapter 5. Verse, shall we read 13 and 14 together? The last two verses, reading. The church that is in Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so does Marcus, my son. Greet one another with a holy kiss of charity. With a kiss of charity. Peace be with you, all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now he says the church that is in Babylon elect. He said the elect one in the church in Babylon, somewhere different from you, they send their regards. And he says, greet one another with with kindness, with love, all right? So, he said, you are a people, behave like that. But I'm just bringing examples, when we cover that, we cover in detail. Now, question number three, very important. Let's, let's see question number three. What does the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ mean for us today? What do you mean for, for us today? We don't sprinkle anymore. Wait, whose turn is it? Uh, Chloe, you want to try? So fast, uh. all right. Hey, Jemima, try. Um, back to Michelle. Michelle answered also because I asked you a question. All right, don't drink water yet. <laughs> all right, so here, yeah. all right, don't drink water yet. After you answer, then you can drink. Now, so we are in New Testament. There's no sprinkling of blood. What does it mean to us? Still same meaning. Same meaning, applied differently. Alright. Okay, I can drink already. Alright, same meaning, yes. No different. It is still about being a people. Being a people. That's why he mentioned you were once not a people, now you are people. So in the New Testament, it means that we are a people of God. Did it ever occur to you? I am a citizen of this country. I'm a citizen of that country. We somehow relate to that very naturally. But from today onwards, when you look yourself in the mirror, tell yourself, I'm part of the people of God. I'm part of the people of God. Very important concept. Phoebe, I'm part of the... Part of what? Part of the people of God. Remember, right? So if Daddy asks you, what do you learn tonight? So Phoebe say, I learned that I am part of the people of... I'm part of the people of God. For the rest of your life, this must be very clear in your mind. But the question is, what does it look like? We'll come to that. Alright? Now, where... So, where can I best fulfill this purpose of God in electing me as... In fulfilling this, I am a people of God. Where is the best place to fulfill this, Susan? In? In church. Why do you say in church? Because you will be with the people of God. I'm glad you say that, not because I asked the next question, what's the meaning of church? <laughs> Alright, right, so, where's the place to fulfill the second part? In church, with the people of God. Now, look up here. Suddenly, I hope now it dawns on you. Many Christians have this concept and this belief, which is correct. I'm saved. God's work of sanctification in my life means I must obey, correct? But most stays just like that. I'm safe, I obey Him. That's good. But this part which Peter mentioned, the second part is something that is very absent and 
either people are ignorant of it or ignore it. You know the difference, right? Ignorant of it means never knew. Ignore means I know and I'm ignoring. Alright? Many are ignorant. Have you been ignorant? Wait, next. Kenny, have you been ignorant? No. But how come when I ask you cannot answer? Now I know. Now you know. <laughs> well, most of us may think, yeah, people of God. But it never dawned on us so strongly. It has never dawned on us so strongly that... Well, dawned on us very strongly to live an obedient life. That's very strong in our hearts, right? But do you realize that it must, for the rest of your life, dawn as strongly on you, I am a covenantal people of God. And I must remember and I must live as a covenantal people of God for the rest of my life. You must, it must dawn on you. But what does it mean? Why is it so important you understand that? First is you must know, is church life optional than for the Christian? Church life is not optional. The people who all stood together and said, with one voice, yes, we will obey. Then they got the blood sprinkle of, on them. Tomorrow morning, they cannot just get up and say, all right, I think I'm going to live with the Philistines. They can't do that. All right, tomorrow, I think I will, I think I kind of like to live with the Amalekites. No, they will now stick with the people of God. Wherever they go, they go together. Wherever they live, where God tell them to live, they live as a people understand this concept church life now before that before that i want to establish this what's the meaning of church uh, back now okay back to ruth ruth what's the meaning of the word church any idea oh where people gather together to worship god okay that's, the, that's what people do in church. But what's the meaning of church? Esther. A body of believers that come together to worship God. Yes, good. Okay. Who knows? Uh, okay, I think... Actually, I taught this uh, many times. Okay, someone shout out, shout out the answer. What's the meaning of church? Very good. Called out ones. The ones who have been called out. This is the meaning of church. The Greek word literally means called out ones. Have you come across this word? Ec ecclesiastes. It has to do with church, right? Alright, church, ecclesiastes. Church, all right. It's from the Greek word "ek." "Ek" means like exit, out, called out, exit. All right. Kaleo is called. So it's church means the called out ones. All right, the called out ones. Now, can you now relate it, relate church to sanctification? Can you? Uh, all right, back to the back. Ichung, how is? Remember, we say. Remember we said Remember we said Through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit To obedience And to people of Covenantal people of God Right? Can, now you, can you, and we said this Is best fulfilled in church Correct? Best fulfilled in church It's about being a part of the people of God Now how Ichung, how can you relate this to the sanctification work? Uh, well, if you, if you treat yourself as one body, you together. Okay, if you treat yourself as one, but my point is this. Now please note this. What is church? Called out. Right? Called out once. This church, right? Now, what is sanctification? Jemima. Set apart. Is this the same meaning? Same meaning? Same meaning. That's why when God says through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto this, God says for the rest of your life, live a life of obedience. For the rest of your life, 
you are called out once. Part of the sanctification work is that you are God's set apart people. You are supposed to be part of church. When he says, who, who greet you from Babylon? Yeah, who's next? Uh, Elaine, who greeted them from Babylon? The church. The church. So what does it mean to us today, the, the, sanctific- uh, the, spring, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, the sprinkling of the blood of, the, of Jesus Christ, is about being part of church. Do you understand that? Many Christians today think that church, think that church is optional, correct? They may say, yes, obedience is not optional. But do you realize, if you read, is God say in election, His intended purpose through the Holy Spirit are twofold. You must not ignore this. When you grow up, are you going to say, once I'm free, eh, I don't have my mom and my dad breathing around my neck to go to church, I'm going to stop going to church. Because why, do Christ, why do young people think like that today? Because they never understood that through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit onto the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, let's move. So I want you to understand this concept. Related to sanctification, I already showed you. Now, now what does it all mean? What does it all mean? Now you know this. Uh, all right, Joshua. So now I know obedience. Well, I've been trying to live an obedient life all my life. Tonight I learned this is supposed to be a prominent and important part of my life now. What should it look like? Obedience, we can imagine. All right, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't go there. I don't say this. I don't, right? Okay. So, I know what this looks like. How do I know that this is true in my life? What does it look like? Being a covenantal people of God. What does it look like? Can you give some examples? Attitude towards church. Example. I really want to be there. Because you know now this is your people. Hey, this is your people, you know? People? <laughs> if God called you to be part of this church, then this is the covenantal family for you. Your people. You want to be part of the people. You look forward to be part of the people. Good. One example, Josiah. Next. So what does it look like? Now I must make sure that this is... Real, this is happening in my life just as much as obedience is happening in my life this must be true in my life another example what does it look like? Hmm? active in church active in church I'm part of this church so I'm active in this church right? that's busy bee who would you rather be at busy <laughs> Alright? Alright? Cornelius, if this is your people, this is your home, who would you rather be with during busy B? With, with the brethren in church. With the brethren in church because your people. Now, once you understand that, who would you rather be with this Sunday when there is evangelism, although it's very hot? Who would you rather be with? Now, your thinking must change. Understand that. God intends for you to have a people to belong with. Now, remember who is this reminder to? The scattered pilgrims, dislike, out of place, Christian, right? And he said, look, you are God's cup. Now, to the Jews, uh, to, to, say, to remind them about sprinkling of the blood is, is very, very, is very, um, what to say, very reminiscent. It will really bring a lot of emotions into their heart. Do you understand that? Maybe I put it this way. Uh, to say, uh, 
Elena Yi Chung, you are married. Remember you're married. Versus Elena Yi Chung, do you remember the day when you exchanged rings? And you planned. And on that day you took your vows to one another. Alright? And then Pastor um, officiated a wedding. I didn't sprinkle saliva on you all. <laughs> right? Now, is it more does it evoke more and stir more um, um, remembering and value than simply say you oh, I remember you're married. Of course, when, you, when they say the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, it will evoke a lot more sense of remembrance. Understand that? So when he says all this, he's, he's saying in the, in, the, in the way to help them remember, remember you are a people. Remember your husband and wife. Understand? So we must... Now, what else? We must remember that. Now, what else? I ask you. Now, the thinking will be like that. If you have a choice, if you had a choice to spend time with your friends in school, if you had a choice to spend time with your colleagues at work, versus to spend time with the people of God, what would you choose? Now, just like you think, do I choose to sin or not to sin is so straightforward, correct? Now suddenly, do I choose to be with the people of God or my worldly friends? Now I'm not saying we cannot have friends in the world, but when you choose, now the Christian must know God's intention of, as an elect is that you be with the covenantal people. Understand that? Hey, let me ask you. Um, Hey, coming to who? Uh, coming to Caleb. Caleb, would you rather spend time with your own family or spend time with your friends in school? Phoebe, would you rather spend time with your Chloe, Chloe, with your friends in in school, or would you rather spend time with? your family family would you rather go on holiday with friends or family i ask you very frankly who honestly probably friends honestly honestly probably friends how does your mom feel <laughs> right so if you're honest we know the natural tendency is not with family understand that the natural tendency is it obedience? No. The natural tendency, well, I won't, well, more or less is as a believer. The natural tendency is that, but you have struggles, correct? The same here, being to say from now onwards, I must treasure. It's precious, people of God, that He called me to. I must, as much as I would rather spend time with the world and my friends outside in the world, I should choose the people of God. Understand that this change now must occur in your heart and mind. This is what God says to the elect. Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is what now should be the, part, the life that you live for the rest of your life. Alright? Okay, so there is this understanding of people that is lost today. Do you understand? It is lost. Young people, in fact, church pastors and, and parents hardly say, be part of God's people. Most of the time, you don't go to friends, ah, children, they've grown up already, they need to be with their friends, let them go to be with their friends. Ah. You know, it's difficult to get them to church. Parents cannot say that. You may as well say, uh, our children don't want to obey God. Uh. Nah, let them disobey God. You, you don't say that, right? You can't say that about this part also. Do you understand what I'm saying? You cannot. You must teach them to love this part. You yourself must love this part. You yourself must change in your thinking about this part. Will you change? It's as big a change you need to make about when you got saved. Now I'm going to start obeying God. It's as big a change here. You've got to start saying now, who are my friends? 
Who do I like to be with? I need to make some choices now. I need to. Because God wants you to be part of the covenantal people of God. Now, let me ask you this. Do you find this difficult to accept? Difficult, right? Difficult. Do you find it difficult for your, to accept when your parents say, Hey, go holidays with us. Hey, after school, come back and spend time with us. Hey, do you find it difficult? Also difficult. Less difficult, huh? Less difficult. Now, why do you think you find it difficult? Now, but, but before I even answer that question, don't stare here. Stare at your Bible. Stare at your Bible, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Now, let's read together. You are elect, right? You are elect. Now, can we read the second part of part 2? Reading. Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What I just taught you, now it's clear, look at here. As an elect, God said, I send the Holy Spirit to work two things in your life. When it comes to sanctification, one is obedience, the other one is sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you agree that it's in the Bible? That's the first question. It is in the Bible. If you say, I find it, I don't want to... I don't want the second part, sanctification, eh, um, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Then you're saying, as an elect, I do not want to obey God. I do not want to have this part of God's people life in my life. You may as well say, I don't want to obey as well. No difference. Right? So you cannot. You cannot say, will you ever say, I don't want to obey? No. Just like the same, you cannot say, I don't want to be changing my life. Just like I changed my life for obedience, I must change my life now about this part as an elect. So yes, it is, to, it is not natural. It is, now, who's hearing this for the, for the first time? Besides Daniel, right? Daniel is raising his hand. Who's hearing this for the first time? That this is for the first time. First time, very often, very difficult to accept. Just like you first become a Christian, first time, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know this. Now, this is something that we have to make part of our life. Now, just like, why is it, uh, uh, is it unreasonable? Is it unreasonable? Listen carefully. Is it unreasonable for a parent to say, you should choose your family over your friends? Not to do sinful things, ah. <laughs> obviously, ah, come on. Alright? You should love. Alright, okay, put it this way. You should love to be with your family more than you love to be with your friends. Is it unreasonable for a child who just keeps going out, keeps going out, keeps going out, and one day the parents say, Hey, you know, you are my child. I gave birth to you. You can't say, ah, I didn't ask you to give birth to me. <laughs> right? The child cannot say, ah, God, I didn't ask you to elect me. Right? I hope none of you say, God, I didn't ask you to elect me. Eh? You are my child. You are part of this home. You are, I gave birth to you into this home. This is home. Why are you always not home? Why do you rather spend time with your friends outside and go outside and always be with them? Is it unreasonable for a parent to say that? Of course not. Right? Is it unreasonable for God to say, Dear elect, when you're saved, through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit whom I send to work obedience in you and to desire that you also live a life with God's covenantal people. My people, whom I shed my blood to save and to redeem. Right? Is it unreasonable? No, it is not at all. In fact, it's very natural, very natural, right? Now, just now, um, Kenny said, the sprinkling of blood has to do with um, Jesus' blood, Jesus' blood to wash away our sins, right? He mentioned that, right? Please understand the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ is to achieve not only just the cleansing of your blood, 
But do you know the word you're called redeemed? Right? Redeemed? The blood of Christ cleanses and redeems. Redeem means buy in exchange for, purchase. All right? Redeem. In exchange for, he shed his blood in exchange to exchange you who were not who were once not a people of God and now through the shedding of his blood now he exchanged you redeem you to be people of God understand that it's just one part you cannot think of the cleansing of your sin redemption without remembering that it's to redeem you to become God's people understand that Hey, redemption is not just God redeem you. That's all. God redeem you to be His people. That is the intention. All right. So, um, just now, yeah. At home, twenty four seven. What do you think? Logically, I think. 24 7 at home yes you have to go to school right you have to go to school you have to run errands it's it's not just about being there right obviously no one will say no parent will say you're my child now you're locked in this house 24 hours by 7 you cannot go out all right this is the heart's natural desire is to be with the people of god is to choose to be with the people of god like tonight there's bible study the natural is God's people are there. I want to be part of that fellowship. Tonight, my friends say, Hey, uh, Michelle, why don't we go watch a movie? I say, The people of God who I am part of. I, I choose them. I'd rather be with them. Like your parents say, Michelle, today family have a gathering. All right? But daddy, my, my friends also wanted to have a gathering. But daddy, you know what? I, I love to be with my family. I'd rather be with you all. Natural. That is what it means. Right? It's not, it's, there's no use. We, you force yourself to church, everything, you come for church, come for church, but your heart is somewhere far away. Right? So God says, your heart must be with God's people. And then your choices will be natural. That is what it means. Alright? Okay? So it's a natural choice to be with God's people. I mean, no one is in church from today at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. What's the point of you being here? It's nothing to do with that. Okay? Alright? But... That's why God says, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves. Because you are a people. The concept of a people. So you must view the church that God put you in as your people. You're part of it. So then, uh, when Mm. there are choices between spending time with your friends or going to church, naturally you would choose church or friends, but when there's no choices between two, like all right so very good question so the question is this um, so when there's a choice when there's a church gathering my people are there of course I want to be part of them but what happened there is none there's no church gathering so is it all right that I be with them all right who wants to answer that okay neighbor Jemima will answer that <laughs> yes so that you can hear it's okay yes all right. So, um, well, of course, the okay depends what you're going to do. Like no simple yeah, no simple like things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. So, well, depends what movie you're watching, right? Um, what about you, uh, the next neighbor? Is it okay or not? All right. It's okay, Susan. General okay. But the question is, what will be better? Right? What will be better? Uh, Ruth, what will be better? What will be better? It's okay, but what will be better? Esther? So when I spend time with them, is to reach out to them with the gospel. Actually, what is better? Joshua? Sure. It's going to say that you have a heart to make them part of the people that you 
You have a heart to make them part of the people of God. You want your friends to be part of the people of God as well. You want them to be saved. Alright? Now, uh, Esther, why are you travelling with your sister rather than with your classmates in school? Yeah. So if I'm traveling with unbelievers, different mindset, different preferences, different choices of things, might make it quite difficult for me. But with a Christian, especially my, my sister who I also know, I know her convictions, I know her desires, I'd rather travel with her. Right? So, I know now these families are very dysfunctional. <laughs> We hate our brothers, we hate our sisters, we hate our parents. It's wrong, all right? It's wrong. It's unbiblical. It's unbiblical. It's because we, we are so changed by the world, uh, we think that it's normal. It's very abnormal. You know, in the olden times, they would die for their brothers. They would give their life for their siblings. It's not like today. Not only you won't give your life, you'd rather take his life or her life. It's wrong. It's so wrong. So to explain this kind of concept is very difficult today. But you think what is natural, all right? What is natural? I put it this way: Would I rather travel with um, Ichung or travel with Sharon? Who do you think? <laughs> <laughs> right? even, even Daniel knows, all right? Not that Ichung is bad. I, I like talking to him. He's fun to talk with. But why do I naturally choose? Because she's my wife. Natural. So what is better? I think if, if this grows in you, listen carefully, if this grows in you, when church has no gatherings, you, when you form gatherings or outings, who would you naturally choose? Unbelievers or from your own people? More natural from your own people. Right? Natural. The thing is, this has to grow. Maybe this has grown much in you already. So, no need to explain so much. But this, now you begin to think, uh, you know, nothing happening in church. I feel like playing a certain game. I think I'll call up church friends to go play. Or travel. Or do things together, right? It becomes natural. But, uh, it, because many of us, obedience we heard. This one, first time. Now there are a lot of things that now you may need to make changes and make adjustments. Unless you say, Lord, I'm only going to obey one, but not two. Can or not? In the first place, obey comes first. It means two has to happen as well. It's about obedience. Here under, a soldier sometimes does not like the command. But he knows, I must submit. Alright? Alright, so some of this change... Um, must begin to happen. Now, but let me ask you, why do you think we don't like? Why do you think you don't like? Wait, who's turn? Josiah. Would you rather... Oh, uh, okay, I'll be honest. Why do you think most of us would rather choose people outside than, than church friends to go out with and to play with? Why do you think that's the case? Which do you prefer? Church friends or outside friends? Say again. Depends on what you're doing. Okay. Things that... Well, it depends on what you're doing. Say again. Oh, okay. No one in church can play badminton like at my level. So it's very boring playing with them. Is it? I really know one now. Okay. No... No one in church? That's the same hobby. Yeah, so if no one in church, well, yes, that's one of the things. Now, if no one in church has that hobby, but then after some time, you find that most of your hobbies, no one in church likes. And then you find that most of the time, you have to do your hobbies with people who are not in church. What, how would you think next? Having understood that God says, through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit onto being part of God's covenant to people. Now you know this is what God wants for the elect. How would you now think? Most of my hobbies, Christian, the churches, the people in church don't like. 
what will you do next? How would you think? Quick, we've got to end already. Say again. Change hobbies. Ah. Change hobbies. So he said change hobbies. Change hobbies. Would you change hobbies? This is assuming the hobbies are not sinful. Not sinful. I'd like to say like I'm going to link back to yeah, I know one at my at my league level. And like, um, yeah, I just mm. You can play. Mm. Yep. But if all your hobbies none, well, if now I understand that God wants me to be part of God's covenantal people, to build up time with them, to be part of them, then I would change hobbies. Even if it's not sinful. God says not always what is expedient, but what is? Say. No, no, it's huh? Yeah. Can you not get them to convert to your hobby? Yes, one of the things is you can introduce your hobbies to church people. Get them, if, don't introduce sinful hobbies, of course, and get them to like it. If it, no one is at your league, train them to be a part of your league. No, don't, don't hide secrets. <laughs> Teach them to play as well as you. Natural, natural, right? Um, so some of these things now suddenly become many questions in our mind but if your heart is Lord really actually we, actually we have time now I ask you this if why do you think God ah yeah, maybe I put it this way before I forget you know for us we keep why ah, how ah, can or not can or not do you know for the people here who are under persecution who are scattered who feels like strangers who, who feel out of place do you know for them to be told that you have a people to belong to? You know how much they treasure that? Why are we like that today? We got so many friends, I'm not persecuted, life is smooth. Why choose church friends? Boring bunch. When we are under persecution, then you will treasure it. Understand that? Alright, so because that's why I say the context is very important. But let me ask you, why does God wants to emphasize on a people. Why is this people? Why do you think this people thing is so important? Why? Uh, okay, kids, kids, kids. We're adults. Share it. Why? Why is it so important? Sense of belonging. Yes, that's one. But besides that, why, why does God say, hey, you're my people? Peculiar, precious to me belong to him but why what is the advantage why is so important say again to help each other to help each other jemima why did god says do not marry another people because they will influence you they will influence you or they may influence you they will take away their, your children or they may take away your children. They will. Read Deuteronomy. Who experienced that? Who did not take God's advice? Solomon, the wisest king on earth, supposedly. He did not. But everything that God says about mixing with the other people all happened to him. Right? Why did God say, be with your people? Don't let the unbelievers be part of people and you don't be part of the unbelievers God is not saying you cannot convert people and lead them in, and become his people like you say why don't convert them and let them be our people right God wants that why God say the people is very important because it is for your protection understand that in saying I, number one I love to be with God's people but even if I don't I must remember God says I do this because it is important to you I ask you to obey me because it is important to you right it's very important that you obey me Christians is for your good also and it's very important that you live this life for the rest of your life because it's very important for you otherwise you will be influenced and even when in here, hey, people seem to be very different from me, either I change or I, if don't make them change to sinful things, I introduce things to them. I'd rather be 
with my people because I know it's safest. Until you understand that you resist this, right? You resist this. It is for your good. Please know that's why this word, look up here. Set apart. Sanctify. Set apart. Why God, God, why do you want to set us apart? Why you keep talking about holy set apart, pure set apart, saints set apart, church also called also called called out. The concept of set apart and called out is very strong with God. What's one of the key verse in chapter one, chapter one, right? Be ye, be ye what? I asked you last week. Be ye. Last week God we learned. Be ye what? Because I am. Be holy, for I am holy. Remember that verse, all right? Be ye holy because I'm holy. Be ye separate because I'm separate. God says all these things is really separating. It's about separation. Being part of God's people is a good separation. The concept is very important. I've seen too many who, when they are young like you, love to come to church, love to be God's people, then they start to mix with certain friends. They may not be evil friends. They may not do sinful things. But slowly, 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 even if it's not sinful, they will draw your heart to the world. Even not sinful things of the world, but your heart. They don't have God in their heart. You will follow them. Your heart will be more and more towards the world, not towards your God. All right? So, it's 9.25. Now, we will, we will cover that, the rest when we come back. So, we'll talk more about this. But today, we learn. You learn from scriptures. I hope that you don't say, I'm, I'm forcing this down your throat. You learn from scriptures is on to... Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and unto being a covenantal people of God for your whole life. It must characterize your life. A Christian who is very disobedient is not characteristic. A Christian who is not interested in being part of God's people, sadly today is normal. But that is not God's intention for the Christian. Alright? Okay, so send me questions if you have questions for clarifications. We're not saying, Paul say very clearly, I'm not saying do not be with unbelievers. You be with them to, to, to make them part of God's people, to convert them. But not mindless, senseless things. Alright, our natural choice. Let us pray. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?